first of all over this nation, we speak Jesus. Hallelujah. A name above every name. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Give him a hand this morning. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Happy Independence Day to everybody. Amen. want to uh, welcome you, those that are with us online. Happy Independence Day to you, wherever you are. And with my spirit, you're with us here. And, uh, amen. We're all with the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless America. Amen. Glory to God. It's in God we trust. Yes. Hallelujah. Not just in our money. Hallelujah. But in every part of our lives and everything that pertains to life and godliness. Hallelujah. Psalms 34, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Yeah. Hallelujah. God bless America. With all of the issues, with all of the crap, with all of the mess, God bless America. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm just going to... I'm going to probably be all over the place this morning. My mind is just... But as believers, church, we need to be willing to stand up for the Bible, for Jesus, and for this nation as we know it's supposed to be. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I know what our founding fathers intended for it to be, and we're trying to move continuously in that direction forever, always, as long as this nation is here. Amen. We're trying to make it a place where all men are created equal, where we all have inalienable rights that God wants us to experience and live in peace and harmony. We're not there, but they weren't there either. But that was the ideal. That was the purpose for this nation was established. And we're going to continue to push towards that high calling of Christ. Amen. For this nation and for each and every person who lives in it. Amen. We've got to stand up for this nation, but we also have to, in order to do that, we've got to stand up for biblical truth. Praise God. We've got to stop cowering as Christians, and we've got to start being who we really are, the army of the Lord. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. We've got, to, we've got to have biblical truth, not just for going to church, but for living our daily lives. Amen. Praise God. We've got to be bold. We've got to be courageous. We've got to be willing to face what is wrong and call it wrong, even if it's not popular. Yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. It's, if we're going to make it, we've already got enemies. There are people who hate the church already. They hate God. They hate everything about it. Right. We've got no reason to cower. It's time now to stand up and say, we're believing God, whether that offends you or not. They're not worried about offending us. I'm not trying to make enemies. I want to win people to Christ. But I'll, I'll be damned, and we will be damned, if we're not willing to stand up for the truth of God. Amen. And if that offends somebody, I'm sorry. I'll pray for you. But I'm not changing my beliefs. I'm not going to cower because you don't agree with me. I'm going to wave the flag. If you can wave a rainbow flag, by God, I can, ra I can wave the flag of the United States of America and say, God bless America. Praise the Lord. Now let's read some scripture. I'll just praise God. Hallelujah. Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. He says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. It's profitable. Scripture is more than just Scripture. It's, it's, there's a profit to using it. It's, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, the woman of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect. That, he's talking about uh, to function like God. Yeah. The way that we were created in His likeness. Boldly, without fear. Without being intimidated. Amen. Jesus lived in a culture that hated him, despised everything that he stood for, and yet he boldly declared the kingdom of God Amen. in the face of all of it. 
How can we do any less? We haven't had to, but now we, we're going to have to or we're going to lose everything. Because I'm telling you, the reason we're in the state we're in right now is because the church hasn't done what the church was supposed to do. The Bible is all revelation, every bit of it. Every word of God is revelation. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. If that doesn't describe the condition of the church today, Tim talked about it. Yeah, there's, there's plenty to be concerned about, but nothing to worry about. We need to be bold. This isn't new. This, is, this was going on from the moment that this message began to be preached in this world. We live in a world. We live in this kind of condition. And if we don't go along with the culture, if we don't go along with what's being promoted by people that are anti-God, that are godless, that, that hate everything about God and the church. I'm telling you, what's, being, what's, what's, what's going on here, what's being promoted, gender changes however you want to. And, and, and Okay, if you're 20 years old, fine, be whatever you want to be. But I don't have to go along with it. I don't have to live my life based on your decisions. But what I'm saying is, I will, I will not allow, I'll do everything I can to stop this crap from coming into our schools and taking six, eight, ten-year-olds and telling them they can pick an identity, they can be whatever gender they want to be. Right. That God's already created them as they should be. Right. Let's help them, let's promote them, let's support them to be what they are. I'll, I'll, I'll respect anybody, any adult's decision to be whatever they want to be, as long as they don't try to force it down my throat. Amen? I'm not forcing you to believe in Jesus. I'm going to offer him to you. I'm going to let you know that he's available for you and that he loves you and that he wants you. If you don't want him, that's your business. You can make a choice. And bless God, I've got the same right when it comes to my sexual identity or anybody else's. what I believe about this nation and what I feel for the flag. The flag's not just a, a piece of material with stripes and stars and, and colors on it. To me, it represents people. It, rep it represents not only those that have died to, so, to protect it, but to die to protect what it stands for. My children, my wife, my, my mother and my father, my grandparents and all that have gone before me. And they gave their lives for this. I'm not hung up on symbolism. But there are times when we need to realize there are things that stand for something and we need to respect it. And if you don't want to, fine. This is a big world. Go somewhere else. Well, you separate in church and state. Look, I'm telling you, I'm a Christian, but I'm also an American, and I've got a right to make a decision and to declare my feelings and my beliefs about both. And if you don't like it, do whatever you want to do about it. But it's high time we started having the guts to stand up and declare the truth of what's going on in our lives and around us. I have a right to defend my faith. I have a right to defend my family. And bless God, I'm going to. If you don't like guns, give yours away. I, don't want to, I would never want to kill anybody. I've been in combat. I've been in, I was in Vietnam. I know what it's like. It's not fun. There's nothing glorious about it. But bless God, I'm going to defend my family and my, my stuff from someone who would kill to take it. That's my right. That's one of my rights as a citizen in this nation. And I'll do everything I can to see to that that right does not change. 
or infringed upon by people who just don't like it. Same people that are trying to use their righteous indignation about some things are willing to murder children, unborn children, by the millions and tell it that it's their right. And you're worried about me having a gun to defend myself. Who's defending these innocent, unborn children that are being murdered by the hundreds of thousands every week in this nation and has gone on since 1970? Millions of God's creation being destroyed by men and women. It's hideous. It's demonic. Let's just call it what it is. It's not health care. Creating, I mean, I understand we have issues. There's one race. Let me first of all just preface this by saying there's only one race, and that's the human race. Within that race, there are different ethnicities. God said we are all equal. We are all brothers and sisters in the Lord. I understand we've got issues. But half of this crap is about dividing this nation, dividing the race, dividing people. And it's wrong. It's been wrong from day one, and it's still wrong today. Jesus said, here's the law. You want to keep the law? You want to know what God wants? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your brother as yourself. Your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Whoever is around you. Whoever you come into contact with. This is about dividing not only this nation, but about dividing the church. We have churches that are pro-abortion. I, 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 I can't fathom this. We have churches that are for gender change and, and, and marriage between two of the same sex. And Okay, you want that? I respect your choice. But don't tell me that's Christian. Don't try, to, don't try to force it on me and mine. You make a choice. That's your decision. That's between you and God. Let it, let it be what it is. But don't try to make it a law or a rule that I have to live by. This is about dividing. It's about dividing the church. It's about dividing people. It's about dividing the nation. Because the enemy knows a house divided cannot stand. Whether it's your home, your city, your state, your country, or the world itself. Exactly. We need, you know, I, you look at this and I'm upset. I don't mind telling you. I'm sick of it. I'm not afraid of it. I'm just sick of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of, of, of trying to be polite and put up with stuff that's just not right. I'll be as polite as I can possibly be. And I'll try to love as, as, as much as possible. But I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to just accept it as a fact, as a reality for myself. Right. Or for the church that I pastor. And anybody has the right. And God knows they've left, uh, you know, I preach and they, they leave by the thousands. But I'm not worried about how many people I can get in the church. If I was, I'd have been done a long time ago. I'm concerned about being faithful to what I believe to be the truth of God's word. If I'm wrong, show me. I told my daughter yesterday I was talking about some things. And right now we're, we're faced with we're faced with mountains, let's face it. We're faced with some big stuff. 
But a guy described faith like this. Y'all, anybody here ice fish? Go ice fishing? Well, let me just ask let me just ask the question like this. Which would you rather have? A little bit of faith in two feet of ice or a whole lot of faith in an inch of ice? Hmm. See, we want to say, oh, well, I'll believe for that one inch. I'll have a lot of faith and belief for that one. Jesus said if you had faith as a mustard seed. Why? I'd rather have, I'll tell you my personal opinion, I'd rather have a little faith in two feet. Yeah. Right? I'd rather, because you're going to get wet on one inch of ice if you think you're going to go ice fishing. But if I have a little bit of faith in two feet, you see what the point I'm making is, I don't need huge faith. It's who I put my faith in. It's what I'm putting my faith in that matters. So I can have a little bit of faith if it's in the right place. If I have a little bit of faith in God, I can look at everything and go, oh my God, what's going on? And my faith just feels like it's being challenged at every, at every turn. But if I've got just a little bit of faith and I know how big my God is, that's plenty. He'll keep me. He'll keep the church. He'll keep the body of Christ. And give me a, I'll, I'll give you a quote. This is from Sir Edmund Hillary. How many of you know Sir Edmund Hillary? Well, back in the 50s, he, he climbed Mount Everest, right? Well, the first time, he failed. He didn't get to the top. And this is the, he gave a speech afterwards, because he was being ridiculed, and obviously people were finding fault. Oh, yeah, he was going to climb Mount Everest, highest mountain in the world. Nobody's ever climbed it. You didn't either. And here's the speech he said. After failing to climb to the summit of Mount Everest, which the, this was the first time, which he did later accomplish. He did eventually climb it. He said, Mount Everest, you beat me. But you're as big as you're ever going to get. And I'm still growing. And I will defeat you. That's what I'm saying to all this crap that's going on. You may think you've got us whipped, but you're... The devil's as big as he's ever going to get. All he's got is the same story. All he's got is the same stuff, just lies. But we're growing every day. We're being renewed every single day in Christ. Though this outward man perish, the inward man is growing day by day. It's being renewed every day. He's as big as he's going to get, but we're getting bigger every single day. Hallelujah. The power of God, the glory of God, the anointing of God is going to grow and grow and grow. His glory is going to fill this earth. Amen? Well, that's my rant. Praise the Lord. I'm just, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not just trying to, you know, give a speech. It's time we, st- look, we've got to start standing up for the truth. Absolutely. We don't have to be timid. We don't have to shy away from these things. Believe me, they're not shy about it. The the opposition isn't shy about it. And I'm not against people. We're not battling against flesh and blood. This is principalities and powers. This is wickedness in high places. We're fighting against an enemy. But the good news is we have the victory over him. But we have to enforce it. We can't just sit back and take it and act as though Oh, well, whatever happens, happens. No, we're here for a reason. And the reason we're here is to enforce the victory of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Christ. We've got the victory. We know how it ends. But you know what? I'd like to see my grandchildren and great-grandchildren grow up in a nation like I grew up in. Have the liberty to believe in God and to worship God and to serve God whenever and wherever they want to. Yeah. And not be told by a government that you can't gather together when Walmart's open. Right. Or you've got to run around with a mask on like the Lone Ranger or something when they can't make up their mind whether they're good or not good or they do any good or they don't do any good. Right. 
I'm not talking anti-American. I'm talking anti-BS that's been coming out of our government institutions and, 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 and places that have just nothing, been, but nothing but chaos and a way of manipulating and controlling people. Well, I'm under the control of no man. I submit to the law of Christ and the laws of the land I'll be compliant with until they cross the laws of God. And that's when I draw the line. Then I'll take my chances with Jesus. Amen. We've got issues because a lot of the church is afraid. It's intimidated. You know those churches that still haven't opened back up? And I was embarrassed to be closed for six weeks or whatever it was. Of course, we're, you know, we're not that significant. We're not, we're not the mega church, so maybe that's not a bad thing. But one with God is a majority. Yes. So let me try to say something. Praise the Lord. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Genesis 1, chapter 3 and 4. I'm just saying we need to be praying. I hope to God that everybody here and everybody that's listening online is praying every day for a real outpouring of God, for a genuine move of God, for true revival and awakening in this nation, and for God once again to shine on this nation, to show His favor to this nation. Humble yourselves and pray, and I'll hear from heaven and heal your land. We need to be praying every day for this. We need to be praying every day for the unborn that are being murdered by the millions. Yes. We need to be praying every day for racial justice yes. and equity. I'm talking about the real thing, not just yes. for political purposes. Yes. And if you're not, you should be ashamed. That's all I'm saying. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Isaiah 42, 6. And I realize it's Independence Day, and people are celebrating with their families, and I'm not against that, and I'm not condemning anybody or judging anybody, but I am going to say this. It's time that we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, you need to be in church with brothers and sisters who believe. And I'm not saying that because I want to fill this church up. You go wherever you want to go. Just go somewhere and be with believers. Go somewhere where you can be strengthened and encouraged to believe and continue to stand in, the, in, in what God has accomplished and what God is wanting us to do in this last day. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thy hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Verse 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them, and not forsake them. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works your God works, and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Yes. Yes. And now John chapter 7, verse 14 through 17. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. The Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? 
Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So Jesus is telling us in these scriptures to take a look at the people in his day. People who held truth to be only intellectual. Capable of being reduced to a code. Remember, I said all scripture is revelation. Their thoughts about truth was that it was an intellectual thing. Like we know and accept two plus two is four. Now these Jewish leaders, scripture says they marveled at him and said to each other, how does this man know letters having never learned? He hadn't studied in the accepted schools. He never went to the rabbinical schools. He, he didn't uh, get taught under some big name rabbi. They said, how does he get this amazing doctrine? And that tells us a lot about their belief that truth was simply intellectual and that truth was capable of being reduced to a code. So to know truth, it was only necessary to learn and memorize the code. They had reduced divine truth to a 2 plus 2 status. To them, there wasn't any mysterious depth in truth. Nothing beneath and nothing beyond. 2 plus 2 is 4. And that's where they parted company with Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus constantly taught the beyond and the beneath. But they never could sense the depth of his teaching. They only saw two plus two makes four. Evidently, the religious leaders believed that words of truth are the truth. And that's still the basic misunderstanding of the Christian church in a large, to a large degree. They believed that the word of truth was true. If you had the words, you had the truth. If you could read the code of truth, then you had the truth. Jesus was showing them he was simply a transparent medium through which God spoke. Listen, you, you, you can disagree with me, but how in the world else can we all be using the same Bible and a percentage is believing that abortion's okay, that gender confusion is fine. Jesus was saying, look, I'm just simply here. I, I, it's like I'm invisible. I'm just the medium through which God is going to talk to you. He was the Word made flesh. Look at John again, 7, uh, 16 and 17. He says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he will know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I'm speaking about myself or if it's just coming out of my head. He said, I'm not a rabbi just teaching doctrine that you can memorize and repeat. What I'm giving you isn't that kind of doctrine at all. See, God doesn't want us to live by theory, but by the strength of the word that he speaks to us personally. Yes. You can memorize the Bible, and there's nothing wrong with memorizing. It's good. But when you're through, all you've got is the body. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Six and seven. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not us. See, there's a spirit of truth as well as a body of truth. 
There is divine inner illumination, you could call it. And the Holy Ghost has to give it to us. Well, we don't know what the truth means. Otherwise, there wouldn't be the confusion we're looking at within the so-called church. The Bible is revelation. But revelation can't save you. Revelation tells us what to believe. It's God's word. But to be light, there has to be illumination. I mean, is it possible to hear the truth and not understand the truth? Isaiah 6 and 9. He said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. So it's possible to see and not perceive. Look at Acts chapter 28, verse 23 through 27. When they had appointed him a day, there came many to him unto his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost of Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross. Let me remind you, these are the people of God. These are his chosen, whom he brings the word in the flesh to reveal himself to. Their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. I don't mean to throw a wet blanket on our party today, but it's time we get real church. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So religion says your faith should stand not in the wisdom of man, but in the word of God. But that's not what Paul said. He said your faith should stand in the power of God. And that's very different. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 14. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But I'm telling you, a large portion of the church operates in agreement with the Spirit of the world, and certainly not with the Spirit of God, or they wouldn't be declaring the things they are. 
Paul said, I preached with power. I preached with power that would illuminate and get to the conscience and to the spirit and change the inner man so that your faith might stand in the power of God and not in your intellect, not in your culture, not in what's acceptable or, or presentable in the world that you're living in, but in the power of God, in the truth of God. That takes illumination, church, is what I'm saying. It ain't enough to have revelation. Proverbs 1, verse 20 through 23. We, if we've ever, you, can't, you cannot live. In this last day, you're not going to live without the power of the Holy Spirit. Without that leading and without that guiding and without that confirmation, spirit to spirit, you're going to get sucked into every manhole that you come across. And I mean manhole. Something that man has dug up and developed and now expects everybody else to jump on board and be a part of it. And we'll even change the religion to meet your uh, political agenda. Well, God is not changing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can change everything else, but He's not changing. And I'd like to have something unchangeable. Something that I know is going to be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of the concourse, in the openings of the gates in the city, she uttereth her words. She's crying. Truth is crying out. Wisdom is crying out in Washington, yeah. in the capitals, in, in, in the states, everywhere, in the streets. Yeah. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Right. And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words to you. If that's not today, I don't know when it was. Your faith can stand in words if it's just faith. But when the power of God moves in on that word, now you've got Christianity. We have called that revival. But that's really not revival. It's just New Testament Christianity. We've settled for so much less that now when we just start to step into what God intended all along, we call, whoa, whoa, well, this is revival. No, it's normal. It should be our normal. We have no idea what revival would be. It, will, it would knock us flat to experience genuine revival. We've got we've to do some rising up to get to a place where we could even realize that we were having revival. Yes. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 through 27. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you don't forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Praise God. We need forgiveness. We don't have to embrace what we forgive. We don't have to walk in somebody else's truth. We walk in our truth. The truth. Or we're just the blind leading the blind and we all end up in a ditch. Now, Matthew 11, 25 to 27. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. 
There is the teaching of Jesus. Not only a body of truth, but also a spirit in that body that we have to get through to. And if we don't get through to the spirit of truth, we only have a dead body. Praise the Lord. Look at Matthew 13 and verse 52. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. He already told us we have this treasure in earth and vessels. That's Jesus. And he tells us out of that treasure there is new and old. And I submit to you today that that new and old is illumination and revelation. Amen. It's not enough to have revelation. There needs to be illumination. The Jews had revelation. But when the light of the world came to the world, they were in darkness. They had no light. They had no illumination. They had lots of revelation. But they were blind. Luke 10, verse 22. And I'm just saying... God is not a respecter of persons. And this church, the church, can be just as blind, just as foolish, just as carnal as anybody else. They can be just as fearful, just as intimidated, and willing to crumble and kowtow to the Romans, to whoever's in charge, to wh whoever wields the sword or we take the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit and we kick some butt and I'm not talking about physically fighting I'm talking about we know that this is a spiritual battle if we're not going to use the spiritual weapons that we've been given then we might as well just lay down and wait for them to come along and cut our heads off All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. See that? All things are delivered to me of my Father. No man knows who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. So I, you can know about God. That's the body of truth. But I can't know God, the spirit of truth, unless I'm willing to be obedient to his will, which is his word. 2 John chapter 5, verse 7, they're not mad, they have to leave, praise the Lord. Well, they may be mad, I don't know. 2 John, uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Well, we walk by faith, not by sight. Remember what I said at the beginning. You just need a little faith if your faith is in that two inch or two feet of ice. You don't need a lot of faith. You just need to walk by faith. You need to live by faith. You need to do everything by faith. And you can have just a little bit of faith if your God is big enough. If your knowledge of God, if your awareness of God, if your faith in Him is based on Him and not you. Yes. The people running around just having faith in faith is not going to get you anywhere. Exactly. You need to know how big your God is. You need to know how much that God can accomplish and then put a little bit of faith in that and you can move mountains. Right. Right. Well, we walk by faith, not by sight. 1 John 1 Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So you, can't, you cannot be enlightened if you're not in faith. If you're not in faith, you're not in light. You're still in darkness. People are trying to be Christians 
based on information, based on revelation without illumination. So they go hear a sermon and go, okay, I'm a Christian, and never exercise faith in anything. That's why they succumb to whatever the culture is demanding of them because they're afraid, because they have no faith. They're standing on their own. They're trying to do it themselves. There's an inner illumination that tells us we are children of God. There's something inside of us that says, yes, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. Even when everything in my mind and everything around me, the enemy's attacking that truth and saying, oh, no, you're not. You're a jerk. You you, you know, you lose it. You get mad. You do this. You've done that. I've been there uh, on the most fundamental level. You can argue an unbeliever into the kingdom of God with a Bible. You can show them all the facts. And they can make a rational decision and say, yeah, well, that's, yeah, that makes sense. The problem is the devil will be there five minutes later and argue them right back out of it. Am I I lying? I mean, we know it to be true because he he comes to us and tries to tell you, you're not saved. So you know that's what he's going to do with a a new believer. You argue them in with facts or with revelation, and they agree with the facts and the revelation, but the devil will come right along and undermine everything that you've said based on the natural facts and, 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 and things that they're seeing because they're not living by faith yet. They're just operating based on some information. He comes to steal the word. And he does the very same thing when it comes to our healing, to our deliverance, to our prosperity. He does the same thing. But if there's an inward illumination, then there is a witness within their spirit and our spirit that says, it answers to the blood, the scripture says. I believed in God for years, for all of my life. And I may have even been saved, but there was no inner voice. There was no inner connection until I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. I'm not saying I didn't have salvation before that. I'm just saying then I had an inner witness. Then there was something that could not, no matter how many times I failed, and believe me, I have failed intentionally over the last 40-some years. But I always knew I was saved. Because that spirit answers to the blood. It, re, it would tell me, yeah, you're, you're acting like an idiot. You're being a fool. But you're mine. You're still mine. All you need to do is get your head and butt wired together here. So everything's working on the same page. And you'll be all right. Then you can say, I am healed. I am deal." delivered. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's revelation in the mind, inner illumination in the heart. And it's true of everything in the Word of God. That's normal Christianity. That's how we should be willing to believe, obey, confess, declare, and agree. He said, if any man will do my will, he'll know. You'll know. You won't wonder. You won't hope. You won't cross your fingers. You'll know. If you're walking in faith, if you're doing his will, you'll know it. You'll know. This is good. I'm, I'm, I'm where I need to be. That's why I'm so proud of of Tammy and Suzanne. They're stepping out in faith with this prophetic. It's weird. I know a lot of people, you know, it's spinning their heads and everything else. But it's a step of faith. That's more important to me than anything else that comes out of it. It's telling me, here's somebody willing to take a risk. And bless God, that's what we all got to have to do. We may not all be in the office of the prophet. But we're all going to have to start prophesying if to nobody else but to ourselves. We're all going to have to start living by faith. We're all going to have to start walking 
out this gospel, this truth, this salvation. When you step out in faith and begin to walk in the word, not just fill your head with it. Illumination will come to your revelation. Suzanne, I, I watched the message last week. It was fantastic. And she, she just touched on something that I had seen previous to this, and it made me think about it. In Genesis 30, where Jacob is trying to get back everything Laban had basically ripped him off for, for 14, 20 years, whatever, however long it was. And God gives him an invention. Gives him a witty invention, you might say. He gives him a, a, a plan. And the plan is, okay, look, I'm not going to fight with you about this, but how about we just start over and all of the, I'll just take these, the, the sickly, pukey-looking animals, you know, the ones that are spotted, the ones that have streaks in them, the ones that are not pure, and, and you can have all these beautiful, white, lovely sheep, and I'll just take all the ugly ones that nobody else wants that are, apparently must be the sickly because they're the fewest and the weakest and the, and the smallest and so forth. And so he said, if I can have those, I'll just take whatever is produced out of that bunch, and you can have all the rest. Well, of course, Laban says, sure. He figures, this guy, this fool, I mean, I've been ripping him off for 20 years. You know, he hadn't, he hadn't learned anything. You know, he's as dumb as I thought he was, and I'll, I'll continue to get rich, and he'll just continue to work for me. So this plan that, that God gives to Jacob, it sounds crazy. It sounds idiotic, like most of what God says to us. It was, okay, now you got all these worthless animals that nobody else would really want, so here's what you do. When the animals come down to water, that's when they old breed. So take you some steaks and trim a little of the, trim them down to the white part of the, of the wood so that they've got spots on them and they've got streaks in them and they've got blotches and they're all looking weird. And then stick those in the ground down there by where they water. So now when these big healthy sheep come in there, they get their drink and then they see some fine looking you and they move on them, and they produce. They produce after what they saw. And all of a sudden, now he's getting all of these ring streak, spotted, mottled, nasty looking, but the strongest now, the healthiest, and the most. They become the most virile. They become the most potent. They become the strongest. And they, their group, enlarges and enlarges and multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and all of a sudden Jacob's herd is greater than Laban's. And Jacob says, thank you, sir. I'll take my stuff and go. Praise the Lord. Well, there's several lessons here. But first of all, it's to believe what God says to you and act on it. And second of all, don't believe everything that you're seeing. Praise the Lord. Step out in faith. Begin to walk in what God has said. If he's talking to you, as long as it doesn't contradict this, it's him. Yeah. You need to have the courage to just do it. Right. Walk in the word. Not just fill your head with it. And then illumination will come to that revelation. If you'll walk in it, that's when illumination doesn't come because you're lying on the couch quoting scripture. You need to get up off the couch and step out into what that scripture is saying and then see the lights come on. And all of a sudden, God will start, you'll have that inner witness. Somebody said, only servants of truth can ever know truth. If you're not willing to act on it, you'll never really know it. It'll always be abstract. It'll always be somebody else's revelation. It's not the body of truth that enlightens us. It's the spirit of truth that brings light. Acting on faith in God's word, in God's promises, will illuminate your spirit inwardly. It'll enlighten you. And the truth that you've known will now become reality. Will now become your life. It will become your truth. And when that happens, 
based on everything I know of the scripture, power will begin to flow. And you'll find yourself, the self you didn't really know existed, the changed self, miraculously changed. So I'm telling you, I'm not worried about who's here, except for their sake. I'd rather have a small group inside than a mega church totally cut off from truth and reality. God can do more with a handful of people who believe and will step out in faith and do what he asks them to do. Look at the scripture. Everything he teaches us is that. Just give me somebody that will believe me. Somebody that will step out and do what I say, and I can, I can defeat armies. I can defeat nations. I can pull down strongholds. I can take mountains. The mountains aren't getting any bigger, folks, but we can. Amen. We'll close with this. John chapter 1, 9 through 14. John 9, or excuse me, John 1, 9 through 14. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, or I might even add, not even of revelation, but that light that was made word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld that light, that glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, who is light, full of grace and truth. Praise the Lord. Can you lift your hands to him this morning and tell him, that's me. I want to be in that number. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Light my light. Hallelujah. Praise God. Give me boldness. Give me courage, Lord. Hallelujah. Give me that witness, that inner witness, Lord. Hallelujah. Light a fire that no man can put out that will burn bright as the sun so that no man can deny that was God. That was a Christ movement in Jesus' name. Give us illumination, Lord, to all the revelation you've given us. And we say right now, do we declare before you, Lord, we will walk in your truth. Give us the boldness, Lord, and we'll step out with a little bit of our faith on a great big God and see the miracles that only you can produce. In Jesus' name. Everybody say praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. Give him a hand this morning. Praise Amen. 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 God bless you. You are dismissed. Happy Independence Day in every way. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.